Our scripture reading this morning comes from the 18th chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 6. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. morning we continue our home improvement series we don't normally have one only two weeks apart from the one we had just a couple of weeks ago uh, but because of covid uh, the father's day one got moved and so we're going to have two kind of close to back to back here but uh, this morning we're going to talk about what parents owe their children you know who are who we are today has as much to do with who our parents were yesterday as anything else seldom will a nation a church, or an individual rise above its leaders. Psalm 127 in verse 3 says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. You know, I'm saddened by the ongoing statements we are hearing more and more denigrating pregnancy as a part of the support for abortion even to the point of delivery and beyond. I read an article this week speaking of how terrible and damaging pregnancy can be upon a woman and upon her life. Foster parents in the last several weeks are being called fake parents as adoption is attacked as an alternative to killing the baby in the womb. The psalmist here says that Children are a gift from God. He says that pregnancy is a reward. As Christians, that's how we are to view it. That's how God views it. And there really isn't room for variation there. The Bible speaks repeatedly of the womb as a place of, of God's work. Both Jeremiah and David spoke of what took place when God formed them in their mother's womb. God told Jeremiah, before you were born, while you were still in your mother's womb, I knew you. So it is the place of, of God's work. Yet many support destroying His work in that, in that safe place through abortion. God forbid. And He does. Beyond the Christian life, in marriage, I do not know any other work that an adult can engage in that is more important than raising children. However, raising moral children in a grossly immoral society is a very difficult thing. This morning we will examine a few suggestions that will hopefully help us be better parents and help our children to be better people and to lay a foundation upon which they can grow into responsible Christian adults. We owe our children such an effort. So let's consider what we owe them. First, we owe our children unconditional love. Our children will ultimately disappoint us our children will, with their choices and their actions at time, cause us to really be disappointed in what they've chosen and done. But that is simply a part of the growth process of any young person. I can tell you, I know I disappointed my parents at times. And I'm thankful that I was given the opportunity to learn from those disappointments, from those poor choices that I, that I made and that my parents helped me learn in a loving and constructive way. Mistakes often provide opportunities, opportunities to grow and to learn. 
At these times, we must never allow our children to think that what they have done has somehow impacted our love for them, that somehow it's changed our love for them, that even uh, that we don't love them. We would never want our children to think that at all. And such a statement does not understand this uh, denigrate or, or set aside discipline. Discipline is a loving act, according to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. But a loving parent will discipline their child just as God the Father disciplines us. Yet that discipline is always from love for that child and what is best for them. Not because I'm mad at them or because they disappointed me or because they embarrassed me. Discipline should never come from those places. Those places are not the places of discipline. Discipline comes from love and a desire to see that child be the very best that they can be. And if you're anywhere other than that, you need to delay until you can find the right place to be when it comes to disciplining your child. You know, we need to let them know that we love them and we only want what's best for them. And that needs to be communicated, shown, and known by our children. Sometimes we are quicker to speak about our children's failings to them than we are about what they're doing right. On the other side of loving discipline is loving reinforcement. Reinforcement of those good things that our children are doing. When they do right, make certain that they know you saw they did right. Make certain you praise them for it. That you let you know how proud you are that they made those right choices. Lovingly praise them. A balance with discipline and reinforcement will keep our children from being bitter or spoiled. One or the other is going to come from the lack of those things. A balance of those things is necessary. Unconditionally loving our children shows them an accurate picture of God. See, God loves us not because of what I do or what you do. God loves us because we're His. That love is because of Him. And He doesn't love me because I've done what's right. He loves me even when I've done what's wrong. In fact, it is that love at that time that prompted Jesus to come to this earth. Romans chapter 5, and that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. And that is the love of God manifested toward us or made known toward us. And so we show them an accurate picture of God when we love them in this way. We love them because they are ours, and that's how God loves us and loves them as well. Every one of us took the hammer and drove a nail into Jesus Christ on that cross. Don't ever think you didn't. The sins that you committed weighed upon Him and set upon Him on that cross, and you were as much responsible for that crucifixion as the Roman soldiers or the Jews that drove, put him there. We need to always remember that. We're not somehow above it. And yet God still loves us. We emulate Christ in this love so that our children see God's love in us toward them and they know God better. In this love also make certain that your love is equal and without partiality toward all your children. Unequal love by parents has been so devastating to so many families. And and we even see that in the Bible, don't we? Go back to Isaac and Ishmael. Go back to Jacob and Esau. Go back to Joseph and the long shadow of evil that parental partiality caused in that family line there in the book of Genesis. It's never a good thing. And it always causes problems and alienation. You owe your children your unconditional love. You love them not for what they do, but that they are from you, like God. We also owe our children time and example. Our children will learn as much and develop as many behaviors from our examples as they will, if not more, than from our words. A church found that they were losing 60% of their children between the ages of 18 and 25 And the elders of that church sought to understand the underlying reasons. Why why is this happening? What can we do to better this, where this number isn't like that? What came of that was an effort over 20 years 
of watching and helping and surveying the congreg- their, their families and their congregation and, and finding some interesting statistics from that. And this is what they found. When both parents were faithful and active in the Lord's church, 93% of those children remained faithful after leaving home. When one parent was faithful and active in the Lord's church, 74% of the children in that, congrega- in, in, those families, in that family group remained faithful. When parents were sporadic with their attendance, the number drops to 53% of the children were faithful. And when parents attended Bible class only occasionally, it dropped to a horrific 6% remained faithful after leaving home. There is a direct correlation to the example set by parents concerning church and our children's future faithfulness. When a child leaves home and they have been shown through their parents' example that there are a number of worldly things that make attending worship expendable, then I can promise you, having worked as a college minister, I can promise you they will find their own worldly things that will make church expendable. And it won't be long before church is completely expendable. It won't be long before they're gone. We set that example for them. They see it. They learn from it. The devil provides all the opportunities for other things to keep our children from going to church. They need to know and understand, though, our, for, through our example, how important the Lord's family is and how important it is for them to be a part of it. Take time with your children to set for them an example of godliness in the areas of life and a devotion to God and His church. Such effort will have an impact on your children's future faithfulness one day, I can promise you. We also owe our children spiritual development. Paul spoke to the Ephesians and said to raise your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and in the teachings of the Lord. That's our responsibility as fathers, as mothers, as parents. Our children are eternity-bound beings. And we should be considering that very, report, that very important reality when we are parenting. With that reality, we see the essential need of teaching our children God's Word. Our children desperately need to know about some things. They need to know about sin. And they need to know about its consequences. You know, it's not just something that God's thrown out there as, I don't want you to do this. There, there's reasons why you shouldn't do the things that God has said don't do. There's, he understands that as a loving father. And we understand it as parents. We tell our children not to do things. They don't understand why, but we do. And we're just as ignorant as children when we think about God and what he knows. Proverbs 13 and verse 15 says, The way of the transgressor is hard. Folks, sin is, is bad. Not just from a spiritual standpoint, but from our life standpoint. Our culture hides all the negatives of the sins that it advocates to people. But sin is incredibly damaging. And it can cause damage that a person may have to deal with for the entirety of their lives. You can be done with sin, but sin may not always be done with you. The consequences of sin continue on sometimes even after the forgiveness is found. Sometimes the effort required to defeat a sin in one's life is heartbreaking. But it's far better to have never gone down the path of sin because we were properly warned. Properly warned of the consequences. I'm a fourth generation gospel preacher and I've been around preachers all my life and I've been told a lot of things. I've been told a lot of stories. I've been told about a lot of mistakes they made. And I've tried my level best to learn. I would rather learn from their mistakes than to make those mistakes myself and hurt people and hurt the church. 
And I think those things have helped me, and I'm, I'm thankful to God for them. It is far better to have never gone down that path to sin because we understand what's down that path. There's damage, there's hurt, there's pain. <clears throat> Excuse me. One sin can take one down a terrible path. Think about it. David, it all began with David seeing that woman on that rooftop. He committed that sin of adultery. And yet, that one sin, it didn't stop there, did it? That was bad enough. But the sin didn't stop there. And before it was all said and done, her husband's dead through the conspiracy of David to ensure that he died. A sin has now expanded to murder. And the consequences of that sin on David in his life were immense. He would lose three children to it because the sin had consequences. David would never know another day of peace in his life because he chose to commit one sin that took him down a terrible, terrible path of pain and heartache. <clears throat> How many people do you think wish they had never taken that first drink of alcohol? Taken that first drug? How many people wish that they had not given in to that sexual temptation just that one time? How many people never get to regret their sins in this life because they died committing them and are now locked into an eternity of regret from which they can never escape? Our children need to understand this. They need to understand that there are terrible consequences that come with sin and the choice to commit it. We need to teach our children the virtue of honesty. We face an honesty crisis in our society today. And you probably hear more lies in a given day than you hear truths in our world now. A survey stated that 91% of Americans lie regularly. And for the Christian, that should be 0% at all. Revelation 21 and verse 8 is quite clear that all liars will be thrown into the lake of fire one day. And not just the ones who told the big lies. He didn't say big liars are going to be thrown in. All liars. And that would include the little white lies too. Honesty is a heaven and hell issue. We need to teach our children to be honest. For the Christian, honesty is not the best policy. It is the only policy. And we need to teach our children that. We need to demonstrate it in our daily lives. Only through raising a generation of honest people can we turn back the dishonesty of our culture. The virt we also need to teach our children the virtue of respect and reverence. Many children and young adults know little about respect and reverence today in our world. And that is because their parents never taught them. And those ideas have no importance in a society obsessed with only the respect and the reverence of self. If I'm the only thing that matters, I don't care one thing about you. I'm not going to respect you. I'm not going to respect God. I'm not going to revere God because I'm number one and that will never enable me to be a Christian. Respect and reverence are at the heart of Christianity. Respect for others comes from the others before self mentality of humility and the golden rule that says that I'm going to do unto you as I would have you do unto me. I'm going to treat you the same way. Reverence and respect are required toward God, toward His Word, toward His church, toward His people, toward His authority as God. And we must teach our children reverence and respect if we are ever to hope for them to view God properly in their worship and in their daily lives of living for Him. We need to also teach our children <clears throat> the virtue of sexual purity. There is a stand, steady bombardment of our children with 
not only sexual images, but the promotion of all sorts of sexual immorality. Children today are having to deal with unbelievable, incredible deviancy that most of us never thought about when we were their age. And I can promise you that if you are not teaching your children about sexual purity, someone is teaching your child about sexual impurity. So you better make sure you're doing your part in this to fight it. As parents, the sexual purity of our children will be affected not only by what we say, but also by what we allow them to do. Dressing immodestly is a path to immorality, whether we want to acknowledge that or, or stick our heads in the sand and pretend it's not the case, but it is something that leads to immorality. And it does not matter if that's how everybody dresses. Immodesty is not determined by how many are doing it. It's determined by what's covered up. All you have to do is watch TV. The world understands this. You know, the world accepts this, acknowledges this, knows it, fine with it. Because all you have to do is watch commercials and sex sales, and what does it sell using? It uses scantily clad men and women. Immodestly dressed, that sells sex. And the world understands that. And sometimes Christian parents hide their eyes to that. Try to pretend that's not the case, but I hate to tell you that it is, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. I've seen it too many times. We can also, and I'm not here to talk about dancing in general as a whole, but certain kinds of dancing will create nothing but lust and a desire for sexual fulfillment. And you need to understand that and know that, and I think you do. We just don't want to accept that. The world knows it as well. They demonstrate it. Why do you think every time in a movie that there's a prom or some kind of school dance or something, there is the follow-up sexual immorality that takes place after it in the movie because they know that's where it goes. They know that, they know that that's exactly what it leads to, but they don't, they're fine with it. But we want to somehow pretend that we live in some kind of world that our children can go and they can do those kind of things and it doesn't have any kind of impact on them morally. And that is naive. That is naive. You've all been young. You all know that that's naive. And we need to think long and hard as parents about those things. Teach your children. Teach your children about sexual immorality and how to maintain it until they can get to that place where the sexual relationship is God-ordained and approved and allowed, and that's in marriage. Teach them to be wise in whom they date. Teach them what marriage is and show them what kind of mar what marriage is by the marriage that you have at home with each other. Remind them often that they are God's children and encourage them to live up to that great name in their actions. I, I remember a few years back, Willie Franklin. Y'all know who Willie Franklin is? Willie played for the Washington Redskins, and I, I, I love Willie. Willie. Willie said he goes out and he plays basketball. He's very much an athlete, and he said, they tell me I'm a skins. He goes, no, I don't take my shirt off for anybody but my wife, and he won't play on the skins team. He has to play on the shirts team. He said, I want to I I be that kind of person. But he was talking to the girls one time at a, at a, at a lesson he was given. He said, now, ladies, you can go out on a date with that boy, and y'all go, and you have you know, lunch or dinner, and you, you go to maybe a movie or something. He says, and then why don't we go somewhere and talk? He goes, you go, okay, let's do that. He said, when you get there and he parks that car in that kind of place where there aren't very many people, he said, you take your Bible out of your purse and put it on the desk. So let's talk about that. He said, you'll be home in 15 minutes, right? Teach our children purity. Teach them what to do in those situations, to look to the Lord and to show the Lord to others. Our children's spiritual development depends on them understanding sin and its consequence. Depends on them having these, these virtues of reverence and respect and, and honesty and sexual purity in their lives. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 6, some scripture that was read a few moments ago. 
Jesus says, but whoever causes one of the, these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, Jesus is, there's a depth to his teaching here. He's talking not only about the child that he has on his lap, but he's talking about young Christians as well. We have a great responsibility to young Christians in the church, and, and we better not ever be the person that creates problems for their spiritual well-being. I've had to tell members, read this verse to them because of the way they treated younger Christians. And tell them, you better be careful what you're doing. Because Jesus, is, Jesus does care. Folks, may we never be a person that creates a stumbling block. Creates that we're a tool of the devil to the downfall of our children. We cannot completely control what our children do. Some parents do the very best and, and, and they still see their, their children leave the path of right. And we're going to talk about that in a later lesson in, this, in, our, in our home improvement series about our children and if they go astray and what does that mean. When we see that, it's a heartbreaking reality. And yet, we see parents that did all that they could and there are simply things, and need to understand this very clearly, there are things that our children will decide on that are beyond our efforts and our control. And the world will have impacts on our children that will have a role in all of that as well. Our main concern should always be that we do not, through our words and our actions, create those stumbling blocks that can cause them to fall. There is a great regret in such things. I told you sin sometimes has a long life of failure or long life of pain. And, and this can be one of them if we do fail in, in our responsibilities as we know that we should have done. And I've talked to, I've talked to ministers, I, I've talked to preachers that said, I wish I, I, I neglected my kids while they were growing up. I was always busy here with this, church, this family in the church. I was busy with this person and that person and everything going on in the church except my kids, and I lost them. I told Jeannie would never do that. I must have as much of a God-given responsibility to my children and to my wife as I do to you. And one does not demand that I neglect the other. It is important that we understand that, that we don't become those things, that we don't cause those consequences. Stumbling blocks can come through action and inaction. It can come through words spoken, and it can come through silence. And there is a time as parents to speak. There's a time to be silent. There's a time to act. There is a time to refrain from action in order to teach and to show what our children need to be in Jesus Christ. And we owe them that. May we take our role as parents very seriously. Love them. Teach them. Show them. Help them. And make the path to God clear and free of those things that might cause them to ultimately stumble. And if there are obstacles in their life, may we have helped them and taught them how to either remove them or climb over them and keep on going. It will be truly great one day to sing around the throne of God with our children. As children of God, we know unconditional love. I am so thankful for it. I don't deserve to stand here this morning as a child of God. I don't deserve to be a Christian. I don't deserve to have my sins forgiven. Never have deserved that. But I am so thankful for the unconditional love of God that His love wasn't affected by my poor actions, my evil actions. But instead, He still sent Jesus so that I could stand here today as a Christian. You can sit here this morning as a child of God. How wonderful is that? He teaches us, uh, as, as children of God, we know that He teaches us so that we can come home to His loving embrace, to dwell in His house and to do His will. As children of God, we know that God has given us all the time since before the foundation of the world. He's given us time. He's given us action. He's given so much to us. 
Follow the history of time and going before time even began into eternity. God has given Himself to us and to our salvation. All looking forward to the life of Jesus on this earth and His death that would pay the price for sin, His resurrection that gives us hope. That is what has been done excuse me, for us by the Father. And we owe the same to our children. There is not a better way than the way that has already been shown by, that, by the one that is perfect in every way there is. Respond today, I hope. I hope that each person that needs to today will respond to the unconditional love of God and become his child. John said, and I'm always amazed at the statement and what it calls for us to do, Behold, behold the love, the manner of love. What, what was done in that love? Behold the manner of love the Father has given to us, has shown to us, bestowed on us. And we can be His children. Folks, there's just no greater honor. And I hope that every day you thank God that you are a child of His because an infinite amount of love went into that taking place. Take time to behold it. Look at it. Meditate upon it. Study it. Know it. The life that God provides to us through His love is the best life there is. There is no better way to live. There is no better uh, way to think. There's no better way to uh, go through daily life than the Christian way. And it not only is beneficial to the people that are around us as, as the Christian life is that which builds others up. It always does that. If your life is tearing people down, you're not living the Christian life somewhere because the Christian life doesn't tear people down. It builds people up. It shows them a better way. Make certain that's the life you're living. The life shown to us in Scripture. Life set forth by Jesus Christ. Not only will you have life, Jesus said you'll have it abundantly. And that statement wasn't just about, yeah, you know, I, I, sometimes we just kind of jump off and we, we, we give that statement away to eternity, to heaven. Oh, yeah, that's, it's abundantly, it's going to be much better in heaven. Yeah, it is. But let me tell you, Jesus wasn't just talking about eternity. He was talking about right now, here, in this, on this earth, in this physical life. It's a much more abundant life. It's a life that keeps itself away from those things that would destroy it. Those things that would harm it. Those things that would take us away from God. This morning, if we can help you come to God, if we can help you respond to His incredible love, we can help you get to that abundant life. We want to do so as we stand and as we sing. Let us reach out and give.